This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Ask the Expert with Steph. Hello, and welcome back to Ask the Expert. I'm your host, Steph Storer, and today I'm pleased to introduce you to our guest, author, historian, Sharon Bennett Connolly. Thank you so much for joining us, Sharon. Thanks for having me, Steph. Well, as usual, I'd love to start our discussion today with a quick biography of Catherine Willoughby. Uh, Many of us simply know her as the wife of Charles Brandon, but she is absolutely one of my favorite figures in the Tudor history kind of realm. And I know that there's so much more to her than just her history with Charles Brandon. So, you know, there's a lot more that's interesting and important and stuff like that. I know that she had close relationships with Bess of Hardwick and Catherine of Aragon and the Grey sisters and so many big names. So can you please give us a little bit of background just so we know her a little bit better before we dive into our listener questions? What do you think? Okay, yeah, I can do that. Um, Well, her name was Catherine Willoughby. She was born Catherine Willoughby. Uh, Her father was William Willoughby, Baron Willoughby de Eresby um, in Lincolnshire. So, which is where I came across her because I I wrote um, an article a while ago about um, Tudor women in Lincolnshire, and I came across Catherine Willoughby and her mother Maria de Salinas, who was um, a lady in waiting to Catherine of Aragon when she first came to England, and she was in fact Catherine's seems to have been Catherine's closest friend and confidant, to the extent that when Catherine was dying um, in fifteen thirty three, it was. Um, Maria de Salinas, who was with her when she died, and Maria and her daughter Catherine Willoughby, who were at Catherine of Aragon's funeral when very few other people would attend. So Catherine was, um, she was a very wealthy heiress because um, she had two brothers, but they both died in infancy. So she was the only child of her mother and father. And when her father died, she was only seven years old. So she was made a ward of Henry VIII, who sold her wardship to Charles Brandon, who at that time was married to Henry VIII's sister, Mary Tudor, who had been Queen of France. So she lived in the highest echelons of Tudor society. And when Charles Brandon's wife, Mary, died, she became Brandon's second, fourth wife. Um, but we'll talk about that comes in the question, so um, we'll leave that bit. After Brandon's death, she married again a gentleman named uh, Richard Bertie, who was a member of her household, and it seems to have been a love match, and also a meeting of minds because they were both very um, had very similar religious ideas. And it seems to, it's more in her relationship with Richard Bertie rather than in her marriage to Charles Brandon that she comes to the fore as a leader of the Protestant Revolution. So that is, I think, the basic history of Catherine. <laughs> the first thing which is which comes to everybody's mind when they find out the age difference, I think we're going to start with her first marriage. So you mentioned that when her parents passed away, she her wardship went to Henry VIII, who then passed it on to Charles Brandon. So she started out basic, really as a child with Charles Brandon and his wife, Mary. So then Mary passes and we have, correct me if I'm wrong here, 14-year-old Catherine and 49-year-old yeah. Charles, who was basically like a father to her, yes. and then they get married. <laughs> Tell us the rest well, of that. That is basically <laughs> what happened was... Um, Charles bought her wardship, which was something that happened in those days when a child was orphaned who had money and land she was go- they were going to inherit. Then they were given into wardship and somebody would buy that wardship um, with the intention of marry- usually marrying that child off to a member of the family. And with this one, it was intended that she would marry Charles's son, um, Henry. Henry Brandon was Earl of Lincoln and he was about, he was 10 years old in 1533. So when he was, he was still a baby basically when Brandon bought Catherine's wardship and she was expecting, he was four years younger than Catherine and they were 
intending to marry intending that they marry each other um but then brandon's wife died in 1533 and he's an, he saw an opportunity he was he was very much a one for opportunities charles brandon especially in marriage to further his own lands and if he married Catherine, then he took control of her lands and her income, which was about £900 a year. And so he did, in three months after Mary died, he married Catherine. And like you say, he was 49, Catherine was 14. Um, her proposed husband at the time, the original one, Henry, he was 10. But he died in 1534. So I do wonder if Henry was already ill and Charles knew that he needed to marry again to get another heir sort of thing, you know, because he he had a... Unfortunately for him, his sons all tended to die in infancy um, or as young teenagers sort of thing. So it was, um, it was probably a necessity that he marry and Catherine was available. So speaking of his children that died young... Um, can you tell us a little bit about the children that he had with Catherine? Um, yeah, that is just so tragic. I, I just feel for her with that one. She had, they had two boys, Henry and Charles. I think, Charles, I think Charles Brandon actually had three sons in the end called Henry. Um, but um, as one Henry died, he had another son. and that's... He just had another replacement Henry always yeah. waiting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They always seem to be in, within a year of Henry dying, another Henry was born. So he had three boys called Henry in the end. Um, he was determined to keep a Henry around. <laughs> he was. I think it was to please Henry VIII, actually. Um, and I know Henry VIII was godfather to at least one of those three Henrys and probably all three. So he had. they had two sons, Henry and Charles. Um, born in 1535 and 1537, I think it was, respectively. Um, Catherine seems to have been very close to them. They were they were lauded as very um, clever boys. They were thought to be, you know, really intelligent, um, good prospects for the future, and um, went to Cambridge to study. And unfortunately, in fifteen fifty one, there was a bout of sweating sickness. Um, the boys moved to Buckden. Um, I think it's the Bishop of Lincoln's Palace at Buckton, to get, to escape and the outbreak of sweating sickness in Cambridge. Unfortunately, one of them had already caught it, or both of them had, and they died on the same day, basically within about an hour of each other. Henry died first, so young Charles, the younger son, was Duke of Suffolk for about 40, 50 minutes before he died. And they were only mid to early teens they were they were not very old at all no mid, yeah mid teens um and Catherine apparently did try and get to them in time she didn't Henry had died before she got there we don't know if she actually saw Charles before he died as well but just she'd already lost her husband um three years before and then to lose her two sons like that it must have been absolutely devastating has to be a strong woman to carry on after that. So tragic, yeah, but carry on she did because there's more. This brief interruption is brought to you by, well, me. Do you love Tudor's Dynasty? Consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Patrons get access to all kinds of amazing things that the everyday listener does not. Find out more by going to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudor's Dynasty and click become a patron for details. All right, back to the show. And also, um, with their deaths, um, she lost her interest in the Suffolk estates. They all went to um, Charles's daughters then, and mainly to Francis Brandon. Um, so she no longer had interest in the Suffolk, in the estates for the Duchy of Suffolk, but she still had her own own estates in Lincolnshire that she had to look after. So that's sort of why she had to move on because she still had estates to run and um, no one else was going to do it now. She was the one in charge. So then before we discuss the next steps of her moving on, you, you had just mentioned that, that she had um, obviously some sort of relationship with Francis Brandon, 
Frances Gray, we know her as also, yeah. correct? Um, what was her relationship with her? And if you could explain then how how they got on after Frances's mother passed. Yeah, they do seem to have got on. It must have been a bit awkward in t- at times, though, because um, Frances was actually two years older than Catherine. How awkward. <laughs> Yeah, awkward much. And also Catherine had been raised to some extent in Charles Brandon's household. So Francis, they would have known each other since Catherine was about six or seven and Francis was eight or nine. So to see your playmate, childhood playmate, suddenly become your stepmom must have been a bit odd. Absolutely. But at the same time, she was Catherine was 14 when she married Brandon, and in the same year, Francis married Henry Gray. Um, so Francis was 16 when she married. Catherine was 14 when she married. So they were both young wives together. Um, and I think it must, it must have been a really odd situation, but you do see throughout the history where they do meet together and they do there does seem to be this wide extended family around Catherine and Charles Brandon so because Brandon I mean Catherine was Brandon's fourth wife and he'd had children with each of his other wives so they were definitely they were only other than Catherine's two sons they they were only daughters surviving so um it must have been um made for some very interesting Christmas sure it was like it was like the first it was the original Brady Bunch but yeah, exactly <laughs> well I'm gonna go a little bit out of order then I was gonna keep going with with um Catherine's life and marriages but I think since we're on the topic of Francis Brandon we're gonna stay here for a second because we have a couple more questions So you mentioned again that, so we know that, that her, I guess, stepsister, is that, no, well, kind of her stepdaughter. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. Right. So, okay. So they, oh, geez. Foster sister. Yeah, really. Okay. So (laughs) this weird step relationship they have, they got along, they're, they're friends. They were somewhat the same age. Um, So they grow up together. They get married. They have kids. Now, obviously Frances Gray had some situations with her daughters we are all familiar with uh, Jane Catherine Mary and how it relates to Catherine Willoughby that we have some questions from our listeners about is there was a point in time when Catherine was a custodian or a guardian of Mary Gray Francis's daughter can you tell us the story behind that and when that occurred you know, what, when it was in both of their lives, kind of what was happening at the time? Um, well, it's um, it really is quite interesting, actually, because the Grey sisters, there were three daughters. Francis had three daughters, Jane, Catherine and Mary. Now, we know Jane's tragic life ended after she was encouraged to make a bid for the throne, shall we say, um, when um, Edward VI died. Um, she was known as the Nine Days Queen, was supposed to be the Protestant claimant to the throne, and the idea was that she would supplant Mary, who was the Catholic claimant. Unfortunately for Jane, Mary garnered enough support to overthrow Jane and imprison her, And then a year later, there was a rebellion in favour of Jane again. So Mary ordered Jane's execution. So that was first daughter out of the way. Um, In the reign of Elizabeth I, then, the other two daughters, Catherine and Mary, were Elizabeth I's closest relations and heirs because the will of Henry VIII had said that after his children, Edward, Mary and Elizabeth, would come the children of his younger sister, Mary. So that would be the children of Francis Francis Brandon and her daughters. Francis um, resigned her right to the throne in favour of Jane. Jane lost it, but Catherine and Mary, the younger sisters, were still the heirs. Now, the younger sisters, they weren't... Catherine doesn't seem to have been very sensible in her choice of husband. 
in that she married Edward Seymour, who was the son of Queen Jane Seymour's brother. And she did it without royal approval. And because she was an heir to the throne, Queen Elizabeth expected her to ask permission. And she also did it secretly. And there was only one witness, Edward Seymour's sister, Jane. Not Jane Senior, Jane Junior. They all had the same name, unfortunately. <laughs> so it of was course. basically his yes, his sister, not his yeah. Aunt. So basically, right. it was dead anyway. But, so basically, her future her, her husband's sister was the only witness, um, and the priest who performed the ceremony was never found. Which meant that when Queen Elizabeth found out about this affair, this marriage, um, which happened because Catherine was pregnant and was trying to find somebody to help her explain to Elizabeth what happened. She went to Robert Dudley, um, the Earl of Leicester, and asked him if he'd approach Elizabeth on her behalf. Um, Dudley knew exactly how angry Elizabeth would be, so he just went to Elizabeth and told her everything. Um, and Elizabeth threw Catherine and Edward in the Tower of London. Um, and Catherine and... Edward were they were separated in the tower supposedly except after the first son was born she got pregnant again so Elizabeth was absolutely furious because not only were they imprisoned in the tower but they were being allowed to meet so she put an end to it completely the marriage was annulled there was because Jane the sister had died there was no one to say that the marriage had definitely happened so the children were declared illegitimate which meant they have they would have no claim to the throne. Because remember, Catherine was Elizabeth's heir. Her sons, if they'd remained in if they'd remained legitimate, would have been the oldest, would have been the next King of England. But because Catherine had done this stupid marriage behind Elizabeth's back, she ended up losing her her sons were taken from her. She was imprisoned and Edward was imprisoned and it must have been just an awful life. Suddenly there was, she'd gone from being the heir to the throne to absolutely nothing. And with this example in mind, Catherine's sister Mary, who was the youngest of the three sisters and um, may have had scoliosis or something, she was um, described as short and hunched back. So it may be that she had some physical deformity. But she was the youngest sister, and you'd have thought that she would have taken notice of her sister's example of Catherine and what happened to her, but she didn't. While Elizabeth was away at a friend's wedding, Mary married um, the Queen's Sergeant Porter, a Thomas Keyes, in secret. But she did, um, Seeing as the marriage had been annulled of Catherine because there were no witnesses, Mary made sure she had three cousins of wit as witnesses so that um, no one could say that the marriage hadn't taken place. Uh, what she didn't realise was that even though that she had witnesses, the Queen would still be furious that she'd married without permission and she threw Thomas Keyes in the fleet prison and um, Mary was put under house arrest. And one of the people for two years, she was actually given into the custody of Catherine Willoughby, um, her step grandmother. And um, Catherine was basically her jailer, although it seems that she was a very kind jailer. I'm pretty sure she, um, Mary, and she and Mary were, seemed to have got very close. And um, Mary was very fond of the Duchess's two children by her second marriage, Susan and Peregrine. Um, who were only 10 years Mary's junior. So, they, you know, they, they were very close. And you see that when Mary died in 1578, she drew up her will and um, she left her mother's jewels to Catherine. So she was still, you know, her mother, Frances Brandon, who had been the daughter of Catherine's husband, first husband, um, her jewels were left to Catherine. So it's nice to see that, you know, they they must have had this close relationship if she was still thinking of Catherine. And it was Catherine's daughter, Susan, who was chief mourner at Mary's funeral. 
So, um, yeah, it, it's it's a tangled web, the Grey Sisters. It's fascinating reading. but it's-, it's so fascinating. But it is one of those things that this is why I love hearing about Catherine Willoughby, because you know all these different stories, and somehow she, like, creeps into so many different stories that we already know, yeah. and we didn't realize that she was there for so many of them. Yeah, exactly. I think that's the thing. You, I think the thing is that you think that, her estates are in Lincolnshire, so you think she spent all her time in Lincolnshire, but she didn't. She was very close to the royal family. Um, she, with when you think of her mother's time as well, her mother had come over with Catherine of Aragon in fifteen oh one, so they had this really long connection through Henry the Eighth, Henry the Seventh, Henry the Eighth, Edward the Sixth, Mary and Elizabeth. You know, through their two generations, they had all this connection to the Tudor royal family and um, yes and she's right in the middle of everything yeah exactly it served her well except for her time under Mary the first of course (laughs) yes of course right okay one more thing then and then we really are going to get back to her life (laughs) after her first husband but so another another thing that we have to talk about because this is another woman that I just love to talk about and they were in it together as well Bess of Hardwick how were they how did, did they have a relationship together? And what was the story? Because I know that there's some gray sister drama weaving in through everybody's stories. So what was Catherine and Bess's relationship? Yeah, Catherine, when Catherine Gray um, got into trouble with Elizabeth because of not asking permission to marry, the first person she asked to help her out was Bess of Hardwick. And Bess turned around basically and said, you stupid girl, I'm not getting in the middle of this. <laughs> sort it out yourself. Smart, smart. <laughs> yeah, but they were. Um, I hadn't realised how closely, how close together they were. Um, Bess was a distant relation of the Greys. So she had an in with the Grey family. And when Francis married Henry, Um, Bess had just been recently widowed from her first husband and um, she actually joined Francis's household as a waiting gentlewoman. Um, That's from Mary Lovell, Bess's, Bess of Hardwick's biographer, thinks that that's what happened because there's a bit where she doesn't really appear anywhere in the records but suddenly, um, when she marries again, she's really close to Francis Brandon, Francis Gray. So she thinks that that's what happened. You know, she um, needed an appointment, so she joined Francis's household after she'd just got married. And um, she, Francis, does appear to have been very fond of Bess because she actually gave her a piece of jewellery um, that Bess is said to have treasured all her life. And then when Bess married William Cavendish, um, her daughter, her first daughter by Cavendish, was named Frances, which suggests that she was named after Francis Gray. And um, Frances and Catherine were her godmothers. And Catherine's 13-year-old son, Henry, the unfortunate Henry who would soon die of sweating sickness, was the godfather. So you, there is obviously this familial, friendly connection throughout their lives sort of thing. And by 1574, Bess actually proposed marriage to Catherine Willoughby, not for herself, <laughs> but on behalf <laughs> of her daughter, Elizabeth, who was 18 at the time. Um, Bess suggested that she marry Catherine's 19-year-old son, Peregrine. Unfortunately for poor young Elizabeth, uh, Peregrine had already fallen in love with the daughter of the Earl of Oxford. So, and it was really a love match. They were devoted to each other. So that didn't come about. But in the same year, Bess was visiting Catherine at Huntingdon, um, along with um, Margaret, the Countess of Lennox, who was Henry VIII's niece. And it seems to be at this point that Bess arranged the marriage of Elizabeth, her young daughter, her 18-year-old daughter, to the Countess of Lennox's second son, Charles Stuart. Now, her first son was Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley, the man who had married Mary, Queen of Scots, as as her second husband. 
so Charles Stuart had a claim to the throne and was uncle to James VI of Scotland. So Bess arranged this marriage between her daughter Elizabeth and um, Charles Stuart, um, the future Count, Count Earl of Lennox, um, which produced a daughter, Arbella Stuart, who would cause trouble for James VI when he became James I in England because um, she had almost as good a claim to the throne as James did and um, she was quite the schemer. In fact, I think, if I remember rightly, Walter Raleigh schemed to put Arbella on the throne, which is what got him executed in the end. See, so for someone that is, and again, just to, re- to reiterate who, who Arbella was, um, on the one side, she was a steward, but yeah. also she was Bess of, Hard- Bess of Hardwick's granddaughter, granddaughter. Yeah. which is a friend of our Catherine Willoughby here. So again, so yeah. for somebody who is somewhat lesser known, she is everywhere. <laughs> it's, it's, awesome. exactly, it's like, oh, come down and visit and try and arrange this marriage that could put that could cause um, repercussions later on to the king. You know, this is Bess was scheming to get her family members on the throne, sort of thing, and Catherine was whether or not she was helping her or just uh, facilitating, shall we say. Um, I don't know, but it's ever so interesting to think of these three women, Bess, Margaret of Lennox and um, Catherine Willoughby, sitting around chatting about who they can marry their daughters and grandchildren to. <laughs> it was a different time back then. So, okay, so we have we have exhausted her little circle, her bubble of friends, her tribe. Okay, so we know how she's in all the different drama and everything of the time. Let us keep going now with her life, the second half of her life. Okay, so she was married very young to Charles Brandon. She had the two sons. They both died. Now moving on, she's a widow. And what happens next? How did she, where and how did she meet her second husband? Well, I can't say exactly where. I can say how. <laughs> and I can't That's say good how long, Let's do how. how. <laughs> she made him. Because um, he was her master of horse and gentleman usher. So he'd been in her household probably for quite for a while at least. Um, when they married, it seems to have been a love match. It was a sensible love match as well, though. In those days, if a widow had a lot of land, she got a lot of attention from ambitious men who wanted land and money and opportunity, um, would try and marry a widow um, in order to get that. So Catherine sort of protected herself against unscrupulous um, adventurers by marrying a man she knew and obviously trusted in Richard Bertie, and they married in about 1553. Um, Bertie was, they were very like-minded. They were both of the Protestant religion, the Reformed faith. They were both had Puritan leanings. So they must have um, really enjoyed their conversations to with each other, and they seem to have got on really very well. And they had two children, uh, Susan, which... I don't know. It's, it's, it seems to be a really modern name for a child in the 16th century to have. I Susan. think her two children by her second husband, the names alone yes. are enough for a whole entire podcast episode. <laughs> exactly, because the son... Susan, right. Yeah, Susan was born in 1554, and the son, Peregrine was born in 1555 and I just feel sorry for Peregrine having to go around with a name like Peregrine. Amazing, amazing. (laughs) Peregrine Bertie, yeah. (laughs) You're not going to forget his name once you've met him, are you? (laughs) You definitely are not and and if school children at that time, well not necessarily school, but if children at at that time were anything like now, that is a tough one to grow up with. (laughs) Definitely. Poor chap. <laughs> but he did grow up, which is nice. Um, <laughs> considering her first two sons, Peregrine did grow up. He married and had children. And yeah, and he had a love, ma- love match as well with Mary de Vere. So that was really, really nice. Susan um, married, but her first husband died. Um, she married um, 
can't remember his first name, chap named Grey, who was Earl of Kent, but he died and um, she married again and had children. So both, the both grew to adulthood is quite nice in those days. I know. There's one bit of, you know, good news in this. So as we're talking about her children, we have yet another another baby, I guess, that has been brought in yeah. to to be under her care. Um, another situation here that everybody knows about is Catherine Parr. Yeah. So uh, if we could talk about Catherine Parr's relationship with Catherine Willoughby, we'll definitely get to that next. But one of our listeners also wanted to know about their baby. So as we know, Catherine Parr, after, after Henry VIII passed, married Thomas Seymour, and they had their baby Mary. So then Catherine Parr dies. Thomas Seymour dies, which that's a whole other story as well. <laughs> um, that's a huge story. But so they both die. And now their baby, Mary, is left parentless. Yeah. And this story of what happens to the baby, Mary, again, is still a story in and of itself. So in the beginning, she goes to Catherine. Is that right? And then what? Yeah, what it is, um, like you say, because Thomas was executed, he would have been under an attainder, so his lands and property were forfeit to the crown. Little Mary, however, was still a daughter of a queen. So as a result, it was expected that she would be raised as a daughter of a queen. So she would have her own household within anybody else's household but as a baby she would need a guardian so Catherine Willoughby was appointed as her guardian which meant that she went to live with Catherine probably at Grimsthorpe Castle with her own household as well though you know she would Catherine didn't have to provide the household the household was with Mary so she would have had to have um, a rocker for her crib um, a wet nurse to feed her numerous ladies in waitings and butlers and all sorts loads of people just to look after this one baby because she's the daughter of a queen and you get this situation where Catherine yes she's a well she's a wealthy woman she has 900 pounds a year and loads of land in Lincolnshire about 30 manors but she has an income for a baroness and yet because she's the dowager duchess She's expected to provide um, a household and the food and drink and clothes and everything that go with it for a daughter of a queen. Now, she's not a princess because you have to be a daughter of a king to be a princess, but she's still one of the highest ladies in the land, this little baby. And Catherine just she actually writes to the counts the privy the privy council and says look i can't afford this you're expecting me to raise this child and all she is is a drain on my income i cannot afford it so the council actually released some of little mary's father's lands thomas seymour um some of his lands were given to her to provide her with an income to help catherine out uh but it doesn't seem that Catherine ever claimed that income, which suggests that by that point, little Mary had died. Um, the last mention of her is on her second birthday, and there's nothing after that. So there are rumours that she lived, she married, she had children, but there's no actual evidence of it. So it seems likely that she died sometime um, after her second birthday and before her third, probably. And uh, um, Linda Porter, Catherine Parr's biographer, um, thinks that she would have been buried somewhere near Grimsthorpe Castle, probably in one of the local churches. So I'm going to have to nip down there and have a look round, see if I can find anything. Yes, will you please do that for us? <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be really helpful. <laughs> That would be very helpful. Thank you. I think a lot of people have been waiting a very long time to find out what happened to this baby. <laughs> I wonder if we could. That'd be nice. Just to uh, It out. would be. And it would be nice for you to be the one to figure it out, right? Yeah. <laughs> Hunting around. So, now, Sounds all right. <laughs> so let's focus a little bit now on her relationship with Catherine Parr, because we obviously know that she, she 
um, was custodian of her baby after she passed. But before that, she was very close with Parr and they were kind of advocates for the Reformation together. How did they come together and become so close? Um, Catherine, as we know, Catherine and her mother Maria had been... So Catherine Willoughby, because now we're talking about two Catherines. Sorry, yeah, you're right. (laughs) Catherine Willoughby and her mother Maria had been in the royal circle ever since the early 1500s. So, and whenever there's a queen, there are ladies in waiting, there's a queen's household. And Catherine Willoughby was appointed to the household of Queen Catherine Parr. So she would have been one of Catherine Parr's ladies in waiting. And she seems to have got really close to Catherine Parr at this point. Um, They were very similar minded in their religious outlook. They were both um, very much interested in the reformed faith. And it seems that um, when Catherine Parr came close to being uh, arrested, Catherine Willoughby almost got caught up in the scandal as well. So they were that close and they were very like-minded on their religion. And um, after after Henry VIII died, I think it was, um, Catherine Willoughby and William Cecil were the two people who persuaded Catherine Parr to publish her Lamentations of a Sinner, which I think turned into a bestseller. So um, I've actually got a copy somewhere, but I haven't got it in here for some reason. <laughs> but yes, they were very, they seem to have been very like-minded and very close, um, a really good friendship um, through their religious outlook as much as anything else. And of course, there were two women chatting. They both suffered losses in marriage. You know, they both lost husbands and things. So I'm sure they had plenty in common to talk about over in an evening and things. Yeah, it seems like she really had, I mean, she really did have a lot of friends around her. She she maintained her relationships. She wasn't known for being, you know, an angry or a nasty person. She really seems to have kept these friendships throughout her life. It's one of the things that makes her so interesting. Yes, yeah, she seems to. She always comes across, whenever you read it, she does come across as a really intelligent woman a very friendly and helpful i mean she wasn't she was a little bit um begrudging of looking after little mary but i think that is because it was stretching her finances so much and she had her own household to look after but she did take little mary in but i think she'd probably been expecting help all the time and nobody sent her any money so suddenly it was like hold on a minute this is costing me and i can't do it (laughs) and who can blame her for that right Exactly. (laughs) So for our last two questions, uh, they're not necessarily, they're more anecdotal, I think I would say, but interesting nonetheless. So one of our listeners had asked us about Catherine Willoughby's dog that she named Gardner. Is this true? Because it seems it, it, I looked it up after the, after we received the question and it, It appears that she named her dog Gardner because she hated Bishop Gardner and it gave her kind of some twisted pleasure. As we just finished talking about what a wonderful lady she was, right? But (laughs) it gave her some twisted pleasure to to be able to, quote, bring him to heel. And that's why she did that. So tell us about the dog. I have to say, I didn't know about the dog until I read the question. And then I thought, I've got to find out about this dog. I thought it would mean something. I thought it would turn out to be, it was something in the Tudors and it wasn't real. But it is real. (laughs) And it is mentioned in John Fox's book, Acts and Monuments. He actually mentions how this um, dog is named Gardner. And it amused um, Catherine's friends when she said Gardner Hill. Everybody laughed. (laughs) (laughs) look at that a sense of humor on top of everything but then you hear what Gardner did to her and to Catherine and you think well I can't blame her I mean there's um she actually says um was quoted as saying at a feast sometime um one evening she said that she was asked who she loved most and she actually said well the man I love least is Gardner 
And um, when Gardner was imprisoned by Edward VI, um, she's quoted as saying, it was merry with the lambs when the wolf was shut up, meaning that Gardner was locked away so everybody else could be happy. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So it wasn't just her, but why don't you just for those who are not familiar with the story, can you can you just tell us real quick how what what Gardner did? Well, speaking of everybody... Gardner, he was bishop of Winchester and he was a staunch Catholic. He had a problem with Catherine Willoughby because she was Spanish and should have been Catholic, you know, a Spanish Catholic, the Spanish are as Catholic as you can get sometimes. Sure. And but she had embraced the Protestant faith, so he saw her as um, betraying her mother and the Catholic faith. So when during Mary the First reign, he seems to have um, launched this personal vendetta against Catherine. He ordered the arrest of Richard Bertie, Catherine's husband, and that he be brought before Gardner. And um, the sheriff of Lincolnshire, who had sent the arrest order to, uh, sort of um, did a little, he didn't disobey the orders, but he did sort of commute them a little. And he basically told Richard Bertie that Gardner wanted to see him. So he had to present himself to Bishop Gardner in London on Good Friday. But he didn't arrest him. He just told him, go and see Gardner. And um, so, which probably upset Gardner even more uh, because suddenly his um, his... Instructions were being flouted sort of thing. And it was, um, he basically was trying to make an example of Richard Bertie to all the people, to all the Lincolnshire people. Lincolnshire at that time was a little bit of a hive for Puritanism. Um, you know, Protestantism at its um, most extreme, they did not like anything uh, of the Catholic faith being in the Protestant faith sort of thing. So they um, were trying the best to eradicate everything Catholic from the um, sermons and things. And he thought that he could use Bertie to show Lincolnshire that he was in charge religious religion-wise. Um, and he did this by saying that the he owed a debt to Queen Mary. It was actually a debt that Charles Brandon had owed to Mary as a princess. And apparently the King Henry VIII had waived it, but Gardner resurrected it in order to make an example of Bertie sort of thing. But Bertie actually managed to run rings round Gardner with the argument and came away winning, sort of winning. But as a result, he realised that under Mary, under Queen Mary, and with Gardner having a personal vendetta against them, that England wasn't a safe place for Richard and Catherine. So it was because of this that Richard decided he managed to get permission from the Queen to go abroad to sell, um, to deal with some land issues from land he, from, oh no, sorry, that was it. Um, Charles Brandon was owed a, owed a pension from the, um, Holy Roman Emperor. So Richard Bertie managed to get permission to go abroad to sort out this pension and he took Catherine with him and their, and their daughter Susan, who was about a year old at the time, because he knew that if he stayed in England, things were only going to get worse. So that's how they ended up on the continent for from 1555 until after Mary's death in 1558. And their second, their second child, Peregrine, was born on the continent at Wessel in Cleve, I think it is. And they travelled all throughout Europe, it seems, and they ended up in the um, in the company of the King of Poland, which is where that Lithuania question comes in, I think. <laughs> but we haven't mentioned that yet, have we? <laughs> it doesn't, but that's that's where we're going. So that's a perfect segue. So the the Lithuania question that that you're mentioning is one of our listeners actually wrote in um, on Twitter asking how they became how Richard and Catherine became administrators of a pro sorry a province 
in modern day Lithuania while they were in exile. So I had never heard that. Um, so that was a very interesting question to me. So if you want to elaborate on that a little bit, that would be great. No, I'd never heard it either. And I still don't know. I've got, I'm going to have to look into it a bit further, to be honest. Um, the only thing I can think of is the fact that they did end up at the court of the King of Poland and they seem to have been on very friendly terms with him. So it is likely, I think, that the King of Poland gave them this land to administer in Lithuania in order to give them an income because they've been out of England for three years. So they probably didn't have um, as much as access to their own funds as they would have done in the early days of their exile. So they were probably getting short on funds and the king said, actually, go and administer this land You've got the, and then you've got the funds to keep you all in comfort sort of thing. So I think that's probably it, but I will have to check that. <laughs> that's, a, that's totally fine. You know, sometimes I don't know is a perfectly good answer because it's one of those things that it, it seems to be a rare uh, piece of information that people don't necessarily know about. So that's totally perfect. And we will continue to, um, we can continue this conversation definitely over social media or, or on Twitter. Um, so just to wrap everything up again, I want to say thank you, Sharon. This was great. Um, we had so much to talk about with Catherine Willoughby. You've given us so much great insight into her. And like I said, if there's any more, um, Sharon's around on Twitter, we will, we'll put all her handles, um, in the show notes for sure. And as always, I definitely want to give a shout out to our listeners who wrote in with questions. Every, you know, every time we put out a show, we are so thankful because we couldn't do it without you. So thanks again to Doug Breeden, Munchkin3571, Carrie Ferguson, Katie Ray, Rachel Dixon, and anybody else who's listening for sure. So keep writing us. We love to hear from you. Um, all our authors and historians love to hear from you. Thank you, everybody. And most of all, thank you, Sharon Bennett Colony, for chatting about Catherine with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. I've had to do some revision on my notes and things, and it's been great fun. I've been Catherine all day, and it's been brilliant. <laughs> I love being Catherine all day. <laughs> Thanks again. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.